to X Rated. This is a podcast by two guys who used to date, and now we talk about movies. My name is Ryan Weed, and that's Matt Fisher. Okay, let's get that out of the way. That was a burden. Thank you. How's it going, Matt? Uh, it's all right. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. We're in the middle of a um, Schlocktoberfest here on X Rated, mm-hmm. and this is our third movie. So it's essentially the Wednesday or Hump Day. Yeah. Of uh, of our Schlocktoberfest. Yes. And I've, I've got a question for you related to that. Humping or schlock? Mm, schlock. Okay. We'll circle back. Okay. Um, are there any horror tropes that really just get your ire up? What's your least favorite horror trope? Uh, probably when they advertise a movie or sell a movie on the premise that like it's going to be someplace cool and then it ends up not being in that place that's cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jason Takes Manhattan where literally 90% of the movie is on a boat uh, heading towards Manhattan. Leprechaun 3, where he goes to Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. There's like a few exterior shots of like him outside the Golden Nugget, or like him talking to like an Elvis impersonator. And then the rest of it's like in this like crappy little like recycled community theater set <laughs> production of a casino. The casino is called like the Lucky Shamrock. Oh, God. And it's, like, a single roulette table and, like, two blackjack tables. And, like, <laughs> that's the casino that they spend all their time in. They just dropped in on an elementary school's casino night fundraiser. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> Hellraiser 4, it's supposed to take place in the 22nd century, like, in space. Uh-huh. But only, like, the first five and the last five minutes do. Everything else is in, like, 17th century France. Jeez. Yeah. That's so a real misdirect there. That, those sorts of things kind of bother me. I always get bugged when the scene is over-relying on music for tension. What if the music's awesome? I, obviously, music is great for horror films. You know, you could put scary music over anything, and yeah. then it's like suddenly scarier. But I don't like it when they're using it as a crutch. So, circling back, one humps or two on camels? Uh, I feel like there's two. How else would you ride them? Well, normally they have one, but some have two, right? Yeah, those are the ones that go by C. Right, one hump by morning, it's going to be a sandstorm. Two humps by C, la di da di dee Yeah, that's how the old rhyme goes. <laughs> well, safe passage through the desert for us. I love, hate, uh, when the false scare ends up being a cat, because that happens a lot in movies, and I remember in Friday the 13th Part 7, and it was doing sort of what you're saying, like, the music's really tense, but it's just, like, a woman walking to, like, a closet where, like, the door is ajar. Oh, yeah. And, like, the music's building, she's walking up to it, and I go, I swear to God, if there's a cat in there. And they open the door, and it's just filled, like, top to bottom with board games. And she's like, oh... And then a cat jumps out. <laughs> and then I was like, where? Like, it was top to bottom board games. You couldn't fit a cat in there. And it jumps out of, like, the middle shelf. Do you think it was um, trying to assemble Mousetrap? Mousetrap, I Couldn't do it with its little paws, so it gave up. <laughs> when you play Mousetrap, did you ever actually play the game? God, no. Who ever played the game? You just build it together and it's fun thing. Yeah. And hope and pray that it works. Yeah, half the time it wouldn't even do that. We'd just, like, take the little dude on the diving board and flip him and try and get him in the... Well, I remember the thing that, like, went down to, like, catch the mouse, like, the cage yeah. that fell. That would get caught, like, 50% of the time. <laughs> so it wouldn't catch the mouse Yeah. anyway? And if you had an old one, like, the little ball bearing got, like, gunk all over it so it wouldn't roll right Yeah, in. and you always needed a rubber band. But it wasn't, like, a standard rubber band. You needed, like, their size one, and it would always, like die so you you just couldn't play after a while what a racket (laughs) i kind of feel like we've talked about mousetrap on this podcast (laughs) before (laughs) oh man if this is the second time we've talked about that uh did you watch anything last week Mm Hmm. i am sticking with horror movies lately uh and i watched the void Oh, yeah, you were talking about that last week. Yeah, uh, it's on Netflix. I don't know if it was a Netflix-produced thing or not, but I hadn't heard about it before it just being on there. But um, it's an Ellen Wong joint, which oh, I love. Yeah. I didn't even know, but I uh, was real excited to see her name in the in the opening credits. I remember that from our Scott Pilgrim episode. Mm-hmm. So I was like, all right, more 
more time with Ellen. More Wong. <laughs> all the Wong you can get. Yeah. And she's great in it, by the way. She's she just she's able to imbue that character with, you know, a backstory and everything, and you just see it from her actions. She doesn't need words to tell that. Okay. She's an actress, I can t- I'm telling you. She can act, guys. Let's, let's keep her career going. By the way, the movie was pretty good. <laughs> Kind of got some Thing vibes going on, oh, okay. um, mixed with some Lovecraft. What is the general premise of the movie? There's a police officer who is doing his patrolling. Some person stumbles across his way, and they're hurt, bleeding. They've just actually been shot. He takes them into the closest hospital, which is this rundown place that like just had a fire in it, but is still operating with the skeleton crew for some reason. Okay. Then uh, weird things start to ensue, and nobody can leave because there's these strange cult members that start to like congregate around the hospital and trap them there. Mm. Yeah. Are you sure it wasn't just the lines outside a Canadian hospital I've heard so much about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean... There was a lot of waste and... Um, <laughs> People dying while waiting for their care. Yeah, their basically. Yeah. yeah, it was a real nightmare. Mm. Produced by Steve Bannon, strangely enough. So, how about you? What you watch? Uh, I'm still chipping away at Toby Hooper's oeuvre. Mm. And right now I'm just sort of frustrated that he has got to be... Not only is he not a good director, but he is so bland. For as many movies as, as he's made... You'd think that, like, he'd start, like, getting his act together or, like, you'd be able to look at him and be like, oh, he really likes these shots or this type of lighting or he likes to put in, like, this, like, recurring theme or, like, this sort of mindset or he sympathizes with the characters in, like, so-and-so way, you know? He takes everything so literally. Mm. It's like, what the movie is called is literally what the movie is about and nothing more. So when I watched his movie Crocodile... What was it about? Well, they thought it was gators. <laughs> That's the twist. The twist is that it was a crocodile. Oh, boy. And it's like, even Crocodile was not his first, like, crocodile-related horror movie. <laughs> he has one from the 70s called Eaten Alive, about a giant alligator that, like, eats people alive. You know, spoiler alert. <laughs> That one has Robert England in it, and he says in the movie, my name is Buck, and I'm here to fuck. Oh, wow. Yeah, so part of the Kill Bill puzzle. I know. Yeah. So, you know, I kind of thought that, okay, this isn't Hooper's first outing with large Everglade creatures, (laughs) but boy, you couldn't tell by watching it. (laughs) He didn't, he wasn't coming at it as like, you know, there were a lot of things I didn't get right in that first alligator eating people movie. (laughs) I'm going to correct those mistakes in my second one. Well, it's like, yeah, if Steven Spielberg remade Jaws today, you'd probably see Jaws a lot more. Yeah. He'd correct on the mistakes that he made, even though the mistakes had intentionally great side effects in Jaws. You know, if he could remake it, he probably wouldn't do it the same way. Sure. More CGI. Yeah, oh, there was so much CGI in Crocodile. (laughs) It had this really awkward thing of, like, the crappiest puppetry you've ever seen, where it was, like... Just what was clearly the top of, like, an alligator, like, made out of a model that was, like, on a balloon or a canoe or something, like, <laughs> floating motionless in what was way too small a body of water for a crocodile. Or you'd see, like, some back angle of, like, a puppet head, like, snapping shut. Or it was totally CG, and that was, like, the only time that it, like, moved ferociously. Mm. When was it made? Like, 98. Oh, yeah, they're spending the money on the CG. Yeah. That's where the budget went for that. Didn't go to acting. <laughs> Horror movies don't j- tend to bring the No, and I, obviously, <laughs> obviously I'm not watching, you know, Leprechaun 4 in space for its subtle performances, but <laughs> there's at least a, a effort, you know. Yeah. I, I want to give these things an A for effort, but... Well, Crocodile does not make that great. <laughs> <laughs> So I watch a lot of horror movies, Mm -hmm. you know, even the bad ones I can tolerate to a certain extent, Mm -hmm. and the nice thing about this is that I feel like I occasionally find a diamond in the rock, (laughs) and I count Stage Fright. Being one of those diamonds. I'm, uh, yeah, 
right out the gate, I just want to let you know that I really enjoyed watching it. Okay. <laughs> Directed by Michael Suave. That is how I've heard people say it. I was excited because I read and I thought it was Michelle. And I was like, oh, a woman directing a horror movie. This will be great in the 80s. No. no man. Man. He's Italian. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's got some other movies under his belt. He directed Cemetery Man with Rupert Everett, uh, which is a fine film. Mm. He's directed like a bunch like both before and after this, but Cemetery Man's sort of well known in the right circle, and this one gets kind of swept under the rug. We have a nice eighties slasher, like classic slasher scenario. Mm-hmm. But it's done sort of through the eye of an Italian, and I feel that it, the Italians definitely have a better gauge for mood. It's my theory that because they they grew up in Italy proper, that they were probably surrounded by, you know, 15th century cathedrals. <laughs> uh, Gargoyles so, staring you down every Sunday yeah, on your way to the grocery you know, store. Big stained glass windows of, you know, some sort of religious violence, like, Ugh. you know, being guilted upon you. Yeah. To paraphrase Eli Roth, Italian horror directors put the gore back in gorgeous. <laughs> Well said. Yes. I mean, this movie had me from that opening scene. <laughs> the second Owl Man gets launched out of the alleyway, I was like, all right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Continue, please. Yeah. There's Marilyn Monroe playing the, the saxophone. saxophone. I mean, the the look of our main character as the, the slow pan at the beginning was like A plus, mm-hmm. top notch. I feel like people are wearing that look nowadays with the oh. hair and everything. Sure. And then the music that starts playing. Yeah. During that first dance sequence is like, yeah, just sign me up. What's I'm here for the rest of the movie. Yeah, the composer who... Uh, I gotta look up his name. Simon um, Boswell. Yeah, he was just in, like, a British New Wave band that didn't go anywhere. And he started making soundtracks to British horror movies, like, independent ones that, like, got zero distribution. Mm. And he did it for free. He just did it because he liked doing it. And then Italian directors heard about this guy who was writing pretty good scores for free. So then people are like, oh, can you just score this one scene? It's five minutes, two people in love. That's all you need to know. And so like he did that a couple times before he was like, I'm not doing this for free anymore. <laughs> He's like, no, I'll do like the whole movie, but you have to pay me. Mm-hmm. So then, yeah, he started doing it. And this was like his third or fourth score or something like that. But yeah, it was it's from, pretty good. Yeah, it was for mostly Italian directors. And yeah, it has that good, it, it's very 80s mm-hmm. rock and roll. But even the like tense moments... Where it's like atmospheric kind of stuff. I noticed mm-hmm. today was like, oh, that's actually pretty good composing there. It's all yeah. synthy. Very synthy. I love was, it. Uh, I was into it. I also like that whatever your music you're hearing is actually what the characters are hearing too, for the most part. Yeah. That opening scene when the music's playing, it's actually being like played by the members of this theater. Like yeah. Like Marilyn Monroe playing the saxophone, stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> or they play Shostakovich's 11th Symphony, mm-hmm. the violent movements of that, a lot. And that's, like, what's playing on, like, the reel-to-reel. There's a word for what kind of music that is, but I don't remember. I gotta say, as much as I like that opening scene, I don't really understand what the play's about. (laughs) Like, I get that it's about some night owl murderer, but other than seeing a bunch of scenes of him murdering or raping somebody, like, what else is this play? Yeah, so the premise of the movie itself is that there's this little community theater... All of them, personally and professionally, are on, like, the verge of bankruptcy. Yeah. And they're trying to stage this play. It's a week before opening. week before opening. Yeah. Someone's actually murdered. Right. Uh, so uh, there's a escapee from the insane asylum. So, no, wait. Before we get there. <laughs> so, the reason this, this per- insane asylum person escapes is because our main star of this play has a twisted ankle, a sprained ankle... Which she never limps. <laughs> like, I, the, I was watching for it too. I was like, okay, your ankle's hurting, huh? Hmm. Let's see, limp. Never once. So she has to sneak out from rehearsal. The, the costume designer, who just got hired like a couple days before, <laughs> is going to take her to this hospital down the road. She's going to sneak out of practice to get her ankle looked at. Turns out to be an asylum, yeah, a yeah. psychiatric hospital. And it's got to be the like worst hospital ever. <laughs> like, they get in and the, The doctor shows up because they're arguing with the receptionist if they can go in. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. I'll totally look at her. It's fine. You know, a doctor's a doctor, right? And then they... That's how that works, yeah. (laughs) Then they get in. He's like working on her leg. And she's like, oh, hey, I saw some dude back there. And he's like, oh, you mean this guy? He's 
total nut job, you know? Like Who's in there? Irving Wallace. Irving Wallace? You mean that actor who went berserk? The same. We're keeping him here while the court reviews his case. Fucking killed a bunch of people <laughs> and like, like where's your doctor patient confidentiality? It's just terrible. Irving Wallace, that's his name. Irving Wallace yeah. is, is the name of the killer who's like strapped down and then for a brief moment seems to gain superhuman strength because he can <laughs> he chooses to break out of these things yeah. just by happenstance. <laughs> in, and his room is just like there's like a, a prison gate yeah. door, basically, rather than a solid door. So anybody walking by can just sort of peek in, like our main character does. <laughs> it's like in uh Silence of the Lambs. How uh, the guy next to Hannibal Lecter was able to throw his spooge onto Claire. Yeah! Look at the blood! Not great. Not great. <laughs> but yeah, so anyway, they leave the hospital and our killer guy has snuck into their car and follows them back to the theater. Mm-hmm. Where he kills the uh, recently hired costume designer wearing a Cramps t-shirt. Oh, yeah, I remember that. I figured you'd take note of that. Yeah, she's pretty cool. She seemed pretty cool. I was kind of bummed when she died first. I mean, a lot of the, the cast and crew, I was like, I don't see the charm of these people. <laughs> there was the super fey one. Don't worry, dear. It's only mother. Who was always arguing with the bitchy one. I mean, they were both bitchy. But... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but I like their banter back and forth. I was like, mm, I can see this happening at a community theater. Yeah. Soup's gay. So, oh, <laughs> blindingly so. <laughs> The flameometer was just in the red. <laughs> I know. Got sunburned from where I was sitting. <laughs> but he's like our main dancer guy. He play in the show, he's playing the owl. Owl. Man. Night yeah. owl. Night owl. Whatever it is. Yeah, the name of the play is Night Owl. <laughs> and it's an un at first it's an unnamed killer who's yeah, just I don't know, raping people in this musical. Yeah, it seems like a lot of sex workers too, that he's just raping and killing. Right, because the opening scene is this you know, call girl of sorts being, like, uh, taken into an alleyway, and the implication is that she's killed, yeah. but then you realize that it's just the opening scene of this play that we're seeing. I mean, the movie gets, like, really meta into all this, too, but it doesn't... I don't feel like it gets up its own ass about its meta-ness. Yeah, I didn't... It, there's a little bit of it in there, but yeah, I thought it was going to turn into one of those, what is real, yeah. who's an actor, and what all that. What isn't a play? Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't do any of that. We're just living theatrically. <laughs> But yeah, so after the first person is killed, the director, who's, you know... A got his, hard ass. Got his ascot and everything, and he's one of those types. British accent, or sort of. <laughs> yeah, it wavers. <laughs> he decides to name the, the night owl from the play, who was otherwise unnamed, after the real killer who got loose. He feels that the, the morbidness of it all will attract a crowd to the theater. Can't say that he's wrong. I didn't disagree with his logic. Yeah. Uh, when he's selling this idea to the cast, he tells our main fake character that your character will no longer be an anonymous owl. <laughs> oh, have I been playing an anonymous owl this whole time? Kind of the starring role. But then the actual killer, Irving Wallace, disguises himself as the owl. So Irving Wallace is now the killer in the play that they're producing and the killer in real life. Right. And he's wearing the same costume, you know, in both. It's... Why an owl, I'm not sure. Yeah. My thought is that Catholicism reappropriated a lot of pagan ideals and okay. rituals. And there's a lot of animals in those. Mm -hmm. They're more one with nature. It was kind of a creepy mask. I went back and forth on it. Sometimes I thought it was silly, but there were times when it was really creepy. Yeah. Because it's kind of big and kind of strange looking. Yeah, so I just kind of figured that maybe if you grew up around violent religious imagery, a lot of it probably involved animals of some sort. Yeah. So maybe it's just weird for me, an American from the Pacific Northwest, but if you, you know, were raised closer to the cradle of civilization, maybe it makes more sense. Yeah. yeah. So he actually even commits one of the murders on stage yes. while they're rehearsing. Since the director has this idea to kind of like change the entire play that they're putting on. Yeah. And moving the opening date up from a week to three days from now, <laughs> which tells me that they were going to open on a Wednesday for some reason because he's like, we're opening this Saturday. He, he makes everybody stay all night long. Like they have to rehearse because everything's getting turned around for this new plot. And they all agree because they're all destitute and 
one of them's pregnant. And oh, like, yeah. They all have their reasons for sticking around. But anyway, so our main character, or our uh, guy who's playing the night owl, disappears at one point, And then they're rehearsing a scene with him where he's supposed to come in and kill somebody. And this time it's the murderer, Irving Wallace, and he actually does murder her. While on stage. Yeah. And that's when everybody sort of realizes that, oh, God, the killer's in here with yeah. us. Yeah. So one of the, uh, I, I'll call this a, a horror movie plot device, as this is the only t- type of scenario where this device would actually exist. But they're in a community theater that only has two exits, <laughs> both of which lock from the inside. Right. So you need a key to which there is a limited number of to get out through either one of these doors and shockingly, they have gone missing. <laughs> so, I was confused for a little while if this was actually a play or if they were rehearsing for some kind of weird movie. Like, th- this movie really takes... Because there was no, like, seats? Yeah! Like... This movie really assumes that you know how plays go up. Because mm. I mean, that was like a sound stage, basically. Mm-hmm. Or a rehearsal stage, pretty much. Yeah. And I assume you just, like, would move from there to the theater when it's time to do that. Mm-hmm. But, um... It was confusing for a little while and until I kind of realized that, oh, this is a play that they're rehearsing for, that they're going to move later. Hence the title, Stage Fright. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Point. But yeah, there's two, there's two doors to get in and out of, unfortunately. And the owner, Willie, has left for the night. He's like, fuck this. I'm going to lock you guys in. Yeah. Just let yourselves out. Yeah, like, supposedly they have their own keys, but only... One of the characters had a set of keys. Yeah, and she got and, he, and the director and gave he, it to her and said, "Hide this." Yeah, because he wanted to rehearse all night. Yeah, and I don't want anyone leaving. And then she's the one who dies on stage. Yeah, so she hides them and then is immediately killed. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> which conundrum? How are we gonna get out, guys? And my main thought was was you know like okay well there's seven or eight of us and one of him. Like, nobody tackles him while they're on the stage there. They're all just... Oh, I mean, I they really wait that scene out. Yeah, I like, understand you're in shock, but... I, I feel like they, they fully knew that this woman was being, like, stabbed and choked. And they're just aghast. Yeah. Off stage, you know, like, watching from the audience. And it's not until, like, the owl, yeah, starts walking away. They're like, what was that? And they go, I'm like, oh, she's dead. Yeah, they watch her get stabbed yeah. and stuff. Sure. It's not a short scene either. No. And then he just kind of walks slowly away yep. to he doesn't Saunters run. off. Yeah. To kill again later. <laughs> I don't know, there's no sense of urgency in the killer. No. I mean, I know that there's not, you know, Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees, rarely do you see them run. Yeah. Uh, but I felt like this guy especially took his time. <laughs> it's really just Grandpa in the grocery store in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I think makes this stand out um, uh, amongst, like, the sea of faceless 80s slasher movies. Like, mm-hmm. that's when, like, the slasher, like, hit, like, it, it's at least population peak. Like, right. You know, you can say what what are, what you'd like about, like, the quality of these slashers that came out in the 80s, but that was definitely when the, the most were being produced. Yeah. And one of the things that makes this stand out is I feel like they took their time coming up with sort of imaginative kills, not, like overly produced or like sure you know totally unbelievable you know we get the one the woman is in the car and she's like having trouble starting so she gets out she gets the pickaxe to throw yeah it's nice yeah simple just i don't know why her mouth was that far open that like could (laughs) go out the back of her neck Uh, there it is uh but like oh no that's a that's a good one. You get the um, the dude who's in the dressing room who starts. You think he's gonna get strangled to death, but no, he gets a drill through his stomach. I particularly like that kill because it shows the killer earlier, like from his point of view, in the wood shop, mm-hmm. and he sees the drill and it like does like a close up of the drill, emphasizing its importance. Yeah. But then it goes back to the dressing room where they're all locked in, and. You kind of forget about that element of it. And yeah, you think that that guy's going to get strangled. And one of the girls is like coming over with a, a pin. A hairpin, to, yeah. Yeah, to stab, stab him. the hand. But then like suddenly his stomach starts turning red. And you realize that he's being drilled through his abdomen. I'm like, yeah. oh, that's good. That surprised me. Yeah. I, I also like right after that, There's she knocks while she's grabbing the pin, she knocks over a thing of fake blood and it spills. 
And then his real blood starts to drip into that. I it's was like, like meta oh, That's yeah. kind of a nice touch there. Yeah. That's one of those things, like, it's meta, but it's it's only really meta for the aesthetics. Like, it fits in thematically to yeah. what the movie's doing, but it's a visual flair more than anything else. Yeah, it's not, like, pounding you over the head with it either. Yeah, it's helping to perpetuate on a visual level the themes that they're already doing, but, like, if you cut that out, like, that scene would still be cool, but it's just... Yeah. It's one more layer onto the themes that they're trying to build here. Yeah. I actually liked quite a lot of the shots. I think this is a really stylish movie. We haven't gotten here quite yet, but when she's in the bathroom, the showers, all the showers, and the owl head kind of peeks up and it slowly oh. like appears there. That looks really cool. Yeah. When they're running through all the scaffolding above, there's some really cool looking shots. There's one like at the very beginning when it's like filmed through the reel to reel and you don't realize that's what's happening until they hit play on the music and then it starts spinning. Oh yeah. I'm like that's so great. It's like that's what makes a movie visually interesting. Well I was I, I also thought like any time that like they show the key to get in or out. Yeah. Like they always do like a big close up of the key where it takes up a lot of times half the frame. Yeah. And then you have the characters like in the background. And it was just it, it's a nice visual yeah. like like element. Like you have this huge key this is what the characters are, like, fighting for. And sometimes it's just something simple, like the owl guy, like, sitting there while the feathers are dropping on stage. So, it, like, you you have just, like, sort of this moving painting almost. <clears throat> mm -hmm. You know, the owl himself is sitting there motionless, but you have this sort of soft rain of feathers coming down around him with, like, the big key in, like, the forefront of the frame. Yeah. It's thinking of a different way to shoot this scene, especially because mm -hmm. she's trying to get the key out from underneath the stage. Mm -hmm. So the key's kind of jiggling around, but it's just... It really puts a different type of focus, and I, I really think it's the type of thing that an American director wouldn't necessarily think of, or, like, someone in, like, the, <clears throat> you know, the factory of creating slasher flicks probably would just gloss over it. It was just... Yeah. It's a, an aesthetically pleasing shot that I, I think would otherwise go unnoticed or, or unmade in an American produced horror movie. Yeah. And I didn't look who bankrolled this or anything, but I could see a major US distribution company seeing some of that and be like, is this too arty? This yeah. feels arty. And like, you know, making them change it. Well, I mean, even like Nightmare on Elm Street movies never, like, they're never as cool as their cover art or like the poster art. Yeah. Like, yeah, they're cool, but like, it's mostly just, like, weird props or something like that or, you know, gross makeup effects. None of them really, like, take the time to, like, shoot the scene in an interesting manner. Yeah, for sure. It's still, like, straightforward filmmaking with, like, a special effect. Yeah. Rather than a special effect filmed cool. Yeah. Going back to uh, the interesting kills in mm -hmm. this movie. I liked when our gay character died. That's a, That was a nice twist, although I kind of saw it coming. Yeah. But uh, it was cool. The director, spoiler alert, uh, ends up hacking him with an axe because he has the owl. He's tied up in this oh, weird yeah. attic of this soundstage. Um, and then the director comes out and it's like, it's over, finally, it's over. Well, I got the implication that he was dead before that. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, I thought the director did it. Oh, no, I, I thought he was already dead and the director was just knocking his cadaver. Corpse. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right after that, we lose a redhead character in a really unique way. Oh, uh, where she, they're like in the attic or the crawlspace yeah. or something and like she falls through. Yeah, he pulls her through because the boards are weak. Um, and then she gets pulled apart. The murderer is pulling her down. The our, boyfriend. Our friends are, the boyfriend's pulling her up. Yeah. And then she, we just start to hear cracking and then she gets... Yeah, the top of her springs up with everyone else and the bottom of her stays behind and get some entrails crawling out and, uh... And depending on, um where you fall on the beginning of life, there could be two deaths there. Yeah. <laughs> She's pregnant. That's what I'm saying. I hope only right-wing Christians are offended. <laughs> but then the boyfriend... Cause the implication is that she had an abortion before. Right, yeah, she's yeah. she's just like, yeah, well, we'll just get another one, who cares? Yeah, or, but then... She's a liberated gal. <laughs> but he's... He, the boyfriend's pissed... And then so he jumps down into the attic or the crawl space there, wherever. The crawl are. space of the attic. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it seems like. That's wet? Yeah. Like the, he's splashing around in water when he jumps yeah, down. Yeah, there's like a holding tank of water in the crawl space of this attic <laughs> where he's getting chainsawed to death. And yeah, the owl comes out of the dark with a chainsaw 
and yeah, then kills the boyfriend as well while the director kind of witnesses it. Yeah, they're all looking on with their flashlights, just kind of watching it happen. Yeah. Again, yeah. just aghast. Uh, it, it's a commentary on the audience of a play and how we're just the audience of life while we let these atrocities happen. Mm, good wow, job. Wow, I pulled that out of nothing. Good <laughs> I just... Whew, I'm going to just go ahead and pat myself on the back for that one. <laughs> well earned. Well earned. Damn, commentary in this movie runs deep. <laughs> but you knew that all along, right? Yeah, I've been sitting on that one for a while. <laughs> Is this when the director dies? Uh, he gets chased down. How did the director die? Well, he tries to reason with the killer. Mm -hmm. But uh, he's come at him with a chainsaw. Cuts off the director's arm. Yeah. And then uh, he tries to take the axe out of his fallen arm, and that's when he cuts off his head. Oh, yeah, that's right. He, put, he also, like, um, our kind of bitchy character i don't know her name but um, i was gonna say the gay one or the lady the lady lady bitchy lady the director actually uses her as a shield and pushes her oh, into yeah. the chainsaw <laughs> what a jerk classic dude move for the longest time i was like well i can't wait for this guy to die because as soon as he as soon as he comes on screen it's like he's just reads asshole I don't know where I came up with this, but I always had the, the idea that, like, directors are always willing to sacrifice, like, the safety and well-being of the actors or the, and the actresses involved. Like, whatever crazy idea comes into their head that they think will, you know, even in a minute way, like, improve the play. Like, they're just like, we're going to do it. Doesn't matter what it takes. <laughs> You're and, on board, right? Yeah. And this strikes me as that, like... He's willing to sacrifice his actors for the greatness of the show, mm. no matter what the danger or harm. Yeah. He doesn't really inspire leadership no. in the way that I think he thinks he does. Yeah, Because he... once the, like, the shit hits the fan, he keeps being like, come on, let's do this. And everyone like questions him at every move. No one just like blindly follows him. Yeah, he seems to think that like he's like this patent of the theater world. <laughs> But, like, no one really seems to have that much respect for him. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone's literally only doing this for the money. Yeah. No, one's, no one ever says anything nice about the play. Yeah. Or, like, that it's a good work or that they're excited to, like, be doing such, like, a great piece of art. Like, everyone's like, I needed the money. Yeah. And That's yeah. how he motivates them to stay all night, too. He's like, we'll pay you now. Yeah. He's not a leader. No. I mean, he barks orders, but... <laughs> no one cares. Yeah. They seem to just question him or not do them. So I was glad when his head got chopped off. Yeah. We haven't really talked about Willie yet. He's the owner of this soundstage. He's in it for like a little bit in the beginning and a little bit at the end. Yeah. But we do get to see his office because at one point the director and, I don't know, Billy Idol, we'll call him, go searching for the keys to get out because yeah. Willie has some keys. And we get a view of his office and I really... Like the character building the prop department did for Willy okay. in the office, because he's got two giant kites in there, and just like, yeah, Willy's a kite player. He also was like, when we first meet him, he's working on a bike, so it's oh, like, okay. there's just like, it's totally unnecessary. He's not a character that needs any backstory whatsoever, but the fact that they give him some is nice. I mean, the only thing that's really in the script is how easily he can be like seduced into doing things <laughs> yeah like in the beginning like it's only like these girls like sweet talking him and cooing at him but like and he caves immediately <laughs> immediately <laughs> oh Willie, please pretty please okay honey i'll do anything for you and that's like his whole character like on the page at least yeah you know, everything else, like, must have been added by, yeah, props or director or something like that. But, yeah. yeah. Just shows, it just goes to show that they thought about the fact that this can, we can tell who this character is in other ways than lines, you know? Sure. Like, have him working on a bike. Show what his office looks like. You know, like, think about, they, they thought about it is what I'm saying. And that's, I acknowledge that and I like it. Yeah. I, I mean, props like that and, like, set design can really paint a character well. Totally. Uh, so yeah, little things like that really can make a difference in how you perceive a character. He also had two copies of that Time magazine with the, what did it say on the cover it was like? I wrote it down. Uh, Debt Bomb. It's Time magazine 
and it's, there's, it's like a bomb, but it's got money exploding out of it. Oh. But he has two copies of it, because there's one on the top of the desk, and then when she's digging through the drawer, she lifts the magazine and finds the gun under it. So I wonder if he's just really well, worried needs... about debt. <laughs> I was going to say, he just needs two tries at the jumble. <laughs> the famous Time he... Magazine jumble. <laughs> he, he insists on doing it in pen. <laughs> so yeah, he's got, he's got um, one magazine coming to Willie, and one magazine coming to Millie. <laughs> Got two subscriptions. One's coming to the theater, and the other's coming to Will. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I guess this is the point when it seems like the killer has killed everybody, or everybody has died. Yeah. And so he's creating his little ritual on the stage of all the bodies. Yeah, he takes all the cadavers and like puts them in certain places on the stage. I'm not sure where the feathers came from. They just had them. Yeah, maybe because they, they were feathers in the production, right? Like, yeah, when she she realizes she's going to get tackled in that first scene, there's a feather that drops. Oh, so okay. they must have had some for the production. I mean, the play is called Night Owl. Killers an owl. I can see feathers being incorporated somewhere yeah. into the fabric of the production, but yeah, you know, we don't. I mean, if they're launching them. dummies up into the air, <laughs> there's going to be some feathers too. I do want to see this play, though. Yeah. It's about a serial killer, unnamed until someone actually dies. But, like, there's songs and there's dancing. Is this and... based on a true story? Like, his concept was that the victim was going to rape the murderer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which, if she's already the victim, she dead. <laughs> How's she going to rape him? It was, it's not what I would call it's Art, Ryan. Erotic. I don't know if you're familiar with it. <laughs> But anyway, our, our lead lady comes back. She falls off a ladder at one point, and we think she's dead, but she's just passed out, apparently. Uh, comes back and realizes everybody's dead. But then she goes to go find the key on her own. And for a long period of time, it's like the whole third act is her... is Snooping doing around, it, yeah. yeah. it's her doing her part of it. Because the movie, like, everybody got killed. Yeah. And I was like, there's still half an hour of this movie. Like, yeah. what else could possibly happen? So, it was a little twist, and it did, but it didn't feel like they were stretching it out. Either. Well, because she finds the uh, Almodovar's gazpacho. Yes. I would also argue that those burning barrels that have been going on the whole time <laughs> could be an Almodovar's gazpacho. <laughs> That's what I wrote when she finally turned it over on the killer. I was like, oh, oh okay. the barrels were the Almodovar's <laughs> gazpacho the whole time. So, she finds a gun in... Willie's dressing, or in Willie's office, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's where she finds it. Under the debt bomb magazine. Under the debt bomb. And so you think, like, the tables have turned. Mm -hmm. Well, clearly this woman's not an American, because she can't use that gun. She doesn't know that the safety's on, she doesn't know how to, like, pull back the hammer, and she doesn't know how to kill whatever she's pointing the gun at. <laughs> yeah, it's just really bad. Bad American. Yeah. Italian-produced British film. <laughs> Yeah, but she she certainly gets a lesson on how to use a gun later from Willie. She does, Willie knows how to use it. Willie's Willie knows American. how to use this gun. For sure. Between his bike riding and kite flying, <laughs> he enjoys a good shootout himself. <laughs> he rides his bike to the shooting range, <laughs> then goes to a, a hill, a windy hill, and flies his kite. That's a that's a good day for Willie. God, just a full, well-rounded, robust character there. <laughs> Returns home to do the time jumble. <laughs> Willie's great. I love Willie. <laughs> <laughs> it may not be the order he does things in. Yeah. He might start his day with the jumble. Yeah. You, know, you don't know. <laughs> but, you know, he's just... His other character trait is that he's easily... Yeah. Easily pushed around by women making... Very faint sexual advances. Give a tug him. at his beard and he'll melt. Yeah. <laughs> Willie, don't go to the shooting range today. Okay. Okay. So, hands down, Willie's our favorite character. Yeah. Clearly. <laughs> He's in the movie for about four and a half minutes. <laughs> oh boy. So, uh, it's just it's just the the owl killer and I don't remember the lead. Oh, I don't either. And the final girl. Yeah. And she determines that the key is on stage. Right. That it's like... Stuck in the... Between two boards. Yeah. So she sneaks under the stage. Because he's just sitting on a chair with yeah. his... Surrounded by his cadavers listening to music. 
Yeah, the with math, the math sort of creates like sort of a, a good level of ambiguity because you can't tell necessarily what he's looking at or what he can see. Right. So he's sitting on stage. He's got the cadavers around him. The feathers are falling. Mm -hmm. And I think Shostakovich is playing. And I actually believed her being able to sneak up on him because he's wearing the mask. Because A, there's loud music. He's got a mask on so he wouldn't be able to hear. His periphery, I mean, his vision is probably terrible in that thing. So it was like, it's believable that she could sneak up on him yeah. in, the, in that circumstance. And they show his, the eye holes in it, and they're yeah. not very big. So it does lead to, like, there's some stuff that maybe he couldn't see. Like, he couldn't see the key being jiggled out of the, the floorboards or whatever. Right. But it also stands to reason that he could see it and was just biding his time. Waiting, yeah. So it, it creates a good level of tension there. You don't know precisely what he's seeing right. uh, or hearing, you know, things like that. But tables do turn the music stops yeah and that's when the key falls yes bad timing <laughs> and then uh yeah. yeah their little showdown yeah oh that's when she dumps the almond of ours gazpacho on him well yeah they go up into like the scaffolding first oh right yeah yeah and they like he gets knocked down but like grabs onto the rope or it's a cable i think yeah it's it, so yeah it's a um, what you plug lights into kind of kind of thing extension cable And she's axing away at it. Uh, He's just using his upper body to climb back up, too. I don't know if I can use my legs to climb a rope. I feel like my big flat feet would just slide. They wouldn't actually help me climb up the rope at all. Well, he's just hand over hand, no problem. Which I would be, I'd be like, oh. Don't you remember him breaking those straps? Oh, yeah. He's got super He's got bird strength. strength. Yeah, a bird can eat its own weight and seeds every day. So I, I don't doubt that they're very strong. Anyway, he's climbing up and then she hacks away at it and he falls. Yes. And it's sort of the false death, the sudden sense of safety death, you right. know. Michael Myers in the closet, you know, stabbed with wire hanger death. Yeah. Because she goes down and she thinks that she's somewhat in the clear. You mm-hmm. know, she's definitely apprehensive about it, but... But she walks right by him and he grabs her leg. Yes. But that's when we get the other Almodovar's gazpacho. <laughs> the pans of fire that have been burning the whole movie. Yeah, yeah. Which, there were times where I was like, they're just leaving those unattended. <laughs> With all, all these feathers and burn there. down. <laughs> I was worried. I was worried for them. But yeah. it ended up being a good thing because that's what uh, set him on fire. Yeah. And I really like the scene where he, when he catches on fire. Yeah. It's, it looks good. Yeah. It, I mean, granted... I'm sure any stunt guy is prepared for, you know, being set on fire scene, but... That probably looks really good on a stuntman's resume. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, How many times have you been set on fire? I played the night on Aquarius State Fright. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. 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 That was really good. That was a long take, too. You were burning for a while. (laughs) Uh, But, yeah, the way that they film it just looks really good. Yeah. I mean, A, he is actually on fire, but it comes across as such that mm-hmm. he is actually being, you know, burned alive. And, uh, yeah, that's how she makes her escape. I guess we never mentioned this, but there were some cops that were stationed outside the whole time. And we get cut away... Because of the first murder. Oh, After yeah. the first murder, they do the sensible thing and call the cops. But they feel, for whatever reason, the killer's not inside the building. Yeah, they never looked around for Well, they did, they, looked, they did, like, a once-over or something. <laughs> and, like, it's, it's clear. Yeah. They also, there's a line that's like... We've covered the whole area, but there's no trace of the girl. It seems to have vanished from the air. Isn't it muddy outside? Like, it was raining non-stop yeah. outside. Shouldn't there be footprints? I don't know. Anyway. So yeah, they station those cops, and we get this, like, these weird, like, cutaways to them. I don't know if that's supposed to be, like, comic relief. Oh, yeah, where they're just talking about, like, do I look like James Dean? <laughs> My wife's making me eat spinach. <laughs> like, a little slice of life there. <laughs> Get some of that classic British kitchen sink drama that they're famous for. <laughs> Regular uh, Mike, Mike Lee. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so she gets out and then she's... God, can you imagine being the cops walking in and be like, Holy shit! <laughs> yeah. What happened? We were out here the whole time! <laughs> yeah, that happened on their watch. <laughs> oh, boss Ooh. ain't gonna like this. <laughs> Man, Rodney Dangerfield neck 
collar pull. Totally, they're they're totally fired. But uh, you know, I the whole police force is kind of like bad because she goes, she gets treated. I don't know at a hospital for her ankle again, and then she realizes, oh no, my gold watch fell off. I got to go back and get it. Oh yeah. And so she goes back to the theater to get it, which, like, man, I would be, if I was her, I'd be so traumatized I wouldn't want to go anywhere near that, but... Yeah, because this is, like, 12 hours later, and they just open up this crime scene (laughs) to this woman who lost her, no doubt, fake gold watch. Yeah. But I guess, like, maybe that's speaking to the horrors of uh, being so poor that you have to go back to this traumatic scene because she has to pawn the watch now. Don't write on my coattails. You don't do me (laughs) on the way I do. (laughs) But it uh, turns out the cops missed the killer again. <laughs> yeah, because she's there's little placards, I guess. Yeah. To where each of the cadavers were. Right. And she's counting them, and then she's recalling where she saw each of them the night before, and realizes that the police are one body short. Right. The scene also reprises Willie. Yeah. <laughs> Um, he's the one who lets her in, even though the cop said not to. She tugs at his beard, and he's like, okay. okay. <laughs> lets her in, uh, tries to explain to her, gives her a gun lesson, basically. He repeats that line so much. It was loaded, all right, only you forgot to take the, the safety off. You would have gone if you'd taken off the safety. That gun's a cannon. I would have blown his head off with it. You can bet your bottom dollar I'd have got him right between the eyes. And he just says it over and over and over again. In different ways. <laughs> yeah. While she's looking for her gold watch, she finds it. Mm-hmm. I don't remember where it was. Just on the ground under some feathers. Yeah. She pieces it together that the cops are short one body. Mm-hmm. And then we get the unmasked Irving Wallace. But... In that time, Willie was able to get his gun. Yeah. And guess where he shoots? Irving. Right between the eyes. <laughs> Which he then tells us about for five minutes. <laughs> Just like I said. Right between the eyes. That's the end of the movie. Question mark? Question mark. Because <laughs> Irving opens his... She just kind of walks out of that. She's like, fuck this, I'm out of here. And like that's the last we see of her. Yeah. Then we see Irving open his eyes. And kind of smile, like, oh, that's not going to kill me. Yeah, he's got a little wry Mona Lisa smile going on. Roll credits. Spawn, no sequels, sadly. Yeah, they decide to roll the credits over Marilyn Monroe playing the saxophone, <laughs> which I thought was an odd choice, but... Hey. It's the one that I would have made. Yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite five-second bit from this movie? Marilyn Monroe playing saxophone. Yeah. What brought you into the movie will also <laughs> usher you out. <laughs> The movie, it's it's just a good-looking slasher flick. Yeah. I don't know. I'm giving this movie a lot of shit, and I'm sure it's oh, like I don't Oh, I mean, like the, it, there's, but... this movie's hardly airtight, plot-wise. <laughs> like, let's not be putting on airs here. But it, it looks great. It really does. I mean, we, maybe we should put more emphasis on the fact that, like, the shots look really cool. Like, yes. They look, a director's eye was used for this, and it looks really good. Michael Suave says that his two biggest influences cinematically... Are Dario Argento mm, definitely. and Terry Gilliam. Oh, okay. Uh, specifically, that he feels that Terry Gilliam captures like dreamlike qualities better than any other director. Mm, I could see it a little so bit. So he tries to incorporate that element of sort of like wonder and landscape in his movies as well. Sure. I mean, the gore is is good looking. It doesn't look mm. cheap at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, it doesn't seem like they spared expense on that for sure. And I mean, it's just little things like when the owl's sitting there and the feathers are falling, like it's an endless rain of feathers. It's not necessary, but it, it looks good. It adds you know, something for the eye to follow. Mm-hmm. Creates like a color contrast with the rest of the movie and the lighting. It's just a strong looking film. Yeah. It's like a yellow style reaction to American slasher fix, which were inspired by Gallo style. Yeah. So it's like a third iteration of it, or however you want to think of it. Yeah. Which is cool. Yeah. It's taking, yeah, like, the mood and, like, the sense of, like, color and temperament from those Italian horror movies, but putting it into a genre that was popular at this time. Yeah. And the music's awesome, too. And the music's awesome. Totally worth a watch. I really enjoyed it. Oh, well, I'm glad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I worry about some of these uh, fringe choices. That I 
Well, and not to mention the social commentary that's going on that we've discovered talking today. Works on that level too. week for us, Ryan. <laughs> We've looked at a bunch of different types of horror here. We've had the werewolf. We've got a slasher flick. We've got creature feature. Yay! I think it's time to go into witch territory. Ooh. With Teen Witch. Oh, <laughs> what? Yeah, the 1989 flop. Is that the one with Tim Curry? I don't think he's in it. It's got the woman from Poltergeist. Uh, Zelda Rubenstein? Yes. The redhead in it is... Oh, God, what's her name? Robin Lively. I don't know who that is. Uh, well, you will when you see her. Okay. She's a that girl. Have you ever seen this? No. It's terrible. Uh, it's not scary. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, coming of age. Was well, it anything like Teen Wolf? It was basically written as a female version of Teen Wolf. Please say that someone says, you're not going to tell me you're a dyke, are you? <laughs> I'm excited to watch it again. I've only seen it once at a midnight showing at the Egyptian. The so there must be something. Titular Teen Witch was there in attendance. So Robin Lively? Yeah. Oh. Was there a QA? and a Yeah. What'd you ask her? I was too stoned and nervous. So I didn't say anything. What would you have liked to ask her? Well, we'll... I'll talk insert, about that next week. Yeah, we'll, we'll insert that into our pod talk next week. Shall we plug our junk? Let's plug our junk. Subscribe and like and review on iTunes. It's the best way to get the word out to people who like this sort of podcast. Yeah, also tell your friends IRL or on the social media. We are on Twitter at X Rated Movies. Or on Facebook at Rated X Movies. Mm -hmm. You can send us an email if you don't want to put it out there on a social blast. You can private email us x.rated.movies at gmail.com Yeah, you can email us IRL on the DL. Absolutely. <laughs> Join us next week for Teen Witch. Our fourth installment of X-Rated Boobies. Boobies. Goodbye.